Hello, I'm John Eves, and I welcome you to our show. Today we will discuss a topic that is near and dear to me, and that is criminal justice reform. The criminal justice system has three main goals, to punish, protect the community, and rehabilitate the offender. Despite its name, the criminal justice system does little to produce ideas of change. The United States of America is a leading country in the world for incarceration. While our country represents roughly 5% of the world population, we actually incarcerate 20% of the world's incarcerated. We incarcerate more than China, Russia, Brazil, and India. The stats are even more alarming when you look at the race of the incarcerated. For example, African Americans represent roughly 13% of the population, but 30 plus percent of the adult male population in jails and prisons. According to the Sentencing Project, sentencing policies, implicit racial bias, and socioeconomic inequity contribute to racial disparities at every level of the criminal justice system. Today, people of color make up 37% of the U.S. population, but get this, 67% of the overall jail population. African Americans are more likely than white males to be arrested and more likely to be convicted and more likely to face stiff sentences. And black males, black men, are six times as likely to be incarcerated as white men. And Hispanic men are twice as much likely to be incarcerated as non-Hispanic white men. The racial disparity has caused many to advocate for reform of the criminal justice system. The reform is intended to address these disparities along racial lines. Today, we're going to talk about criminal justice reform, but we're also going to talk about a fancy term called restorative justice. Ladies and gentlemen, for our first uh, segment of this uh, show, our guest is Mr. Adam Gelb, who is the president and the CEO of the Council on Criminal Justice. Adam, good to see you. It's great to be with you, John. How you doing? I'm doing fine considering everything that's happened over the, over the past year. Um, and it's just great to be, to be with you and to know that your interest in and leadership on criminal justice issues continues. Absolutely, I mean, we go back several years in terms of when you were with Pew, Pew Charitable Trust and, and yes, yeah, criminal justice is very important to you. I consider you the subject matter expert. You know, so we're gonna just talk a little bit about in a conversational style about sort of the historical context of the criminal justice reform. But let's start with what you do as a, as a CEO and president of the, uh, the Council on Justice. What is that all about? Yeah, thanks for asking. We're, we're really excited about what we're building. Uh, we're, we've been around two years now, which is exactly two years. And we've got two parts of the organization. One is a think tank and the other is an invitational membership organization. We're strictly nonpartisan and our mission is to advance understanding of the criminal justice policy choices facing the country mm -hmm. and to build consensus for solutions that enhance safety and justice for all. That's our, that's our mission statement. What we're really doing is trying to, to say that, if, that, it, that we need to capitalize on the incredible bipartisan agreement that there is and that there has been for the past decade or so around these issues and to harness that and to, to, to use it uh, to advance uh, reforms that will reduce those racial disparities that you talked about, that will reduce the overall uh, footprint of the criminal justice system. You know, I think that's, that's important what you said because a lot of times, even though with the stats that I referenced, a uh, disproportionate number of people of color and, uh, sort of in, plagued by the criminal justice system, if I can describe it that way, it really is becoming a bipartisan issue. So your, your purview is, is sort of a national review of what's going on in this country. That's exactly right. And, and uh, just to emphasize the importance of this, not that it's going to be lost on any of your viewers, but the very first report that we put out shortly after, uh, after we organized was a report that tracks the racial disparity trends in our correction system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you're absolutely right the way you laid out those uh, statistics uh, just a minute ago. But I think it's really important for, uh, for your viewers to know that we're actually making progress on this. The way I've characterized it is that this is, it's a situation that has gone from worse to bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that is, uh, the, uh, for instance, uh, the ratio 
of imprisoned uh, women, blacks to whites, has dropped from six to one mm -hmm. to two to one. Mm -hmm. So it's dropped by two thirds. Mm -hmm. Two to one is still too high. Right, right. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But, uh, but we've made progress there. When you look at uh, the number of people and the rate uh, at which people are locked up for drug offenses, it used to be 15 blacks mm -hmm. to, uh, for every one white. That's dropped to five to one. Wow. So that's also, that's also come down. And I, I think it's, it's just incredibly important to look at the, the, the trends because it suggests that we can do something about these problems. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not intractable, uh, and and it's really important. And that's what we did in this first study to try to to try to say, let's unpack that. Let's just not bemoan it, mm -hmm. but let's unpack it and try to understand really why things are coming down and what are the bottlenecks that are keeping keeping these disparities as wide as they are. So, Adam, if we were to kind of look at this this as a delivery system, from arrest to incarceration to release what do you i mean what part of the system that you feel the most optimistic about in terms of change is it the law enforcement part is it the actual um the 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 sentencing part is it the incarceration part is the reentry re part what what aspect of it is are you most optimistic what a great about? question and and i and i it's a it's a question that's a little bit easier to answer on the count of this analysis that we did. Uh, the answer is gonna be surprising, I think, to some of your okay. viewers because of what we've experienced mm -hmm. uh, over the past year uh, with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and of course, uh, here in Georgia with Richard Brooks and, and Ahmaud Aubrey, and mm -hmm. that the whole situation with policing, uh, which is in dire need of improvement. The main reason why those disparities have been shrinking, the main reason has been uh, police activity. Okay. Police are arresting a lot fewer people mm -hmm. across this country today than they were uh, back in the 90s at the height of the drug war. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to arrest about 15 million people a year. That's down to about 10 million. Wow. Now there's still, that's a drop of a third. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot fewer people getting arrested. Mm -hmm. Still way too many people and way too many people for minor offenses, including minor drug offenses. Uh, but police behavior is changing, uh, people's behavior is changing, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, once people are arrested and brought to court, uh, there have been a lot of reforms, as you well know of, and led some uh, here, and now, uh, the efforts of uh, Governor Deal uh, mm -hmm. and, and others in the legislature continue uh, to this day, uh, but um, they have been generally less impactful mm -hmm. on reducing disparities than what's happening at what we call the front end of the system with the police. So, I mean, I, I, that's pretty optimistic. I didn't, I didn't realize that it's the, the input has been reduced in terms of the arrests. Um, do you think that some of the, the activity, the, the Black Lives Matter movement that occurred in 2020, the Breonna Taylor uh, no-knock warrants, have, are those having some sort of impact, positively or negatively, in terms of the the law enforcement piece. Yeah, uh, it's hard to imagine that they're not having overall net positive okay. impact. It's mm -hmm. just uh, in, in our conversations with people who are our board members and our general members uh, of the Council on Criminal Justice, uh, you see it, you feel it every day. It's mm -hmm. informing how people are thinking about this, how they're talking about it, how they're acting about it. Uh, at the same time, uh, being here uh, in Atlanta and having gone through the Senate runoff uh, mm -hmm. elections, mm -hmm. uh, feels to me like they were about a quarter billion dollars worth of, of ads taken out More on TV. <laughs> well, I think it was about a, a, about a half billion yeah, yeah, total. Yeah. Felt to me like about half of that was about defund the police yeah. and, and whether the candidates were for the police or against the police. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, these sort of, these fine lines have been drawn. And I'm not sure that that's, that's very productive conversation and it's not really pulling people together and having a serious conversation about what kind of policing we do want and how do we best produce safety in communities. You know, good content. We've got a few minutes to go, but I want to do two things real quickly. Number one, I want to connect what you just said about defunding police. And so this drop in, in law enforcement arrests, has there been a sacrifice of, of uh, more crime? Is there more crime in, in the communities because of less arrests? Have you done any research in that area? Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's very clear that crime has dropped substantially mm -hmm. since the early 1990s. In fact, violent crime rates overall are down uh, more than 50% and property crime rates are down more like 70, 75%. So there's way less crime in this country overall than there used to be mm -hmm. on account of many things. The last year, 
right. things things have gone haywire in mm -hmm. so many ways, mm -hmm. uh, with murders in particular and aggravated assaults spiking um, here in Atlanta. Um, biggest you know one year increase um, uh, in in quite some time nationally, the biggest mm -hmm. uh, one year increase in, in history. At the same time, with people locked down and, and staying at home and and businesses shut down, we've had a a, a big drop in in property crimes mm -hmm. and those kinds of those kinds of thefts. Mm -hmm. So. But the, but the short-term spike, has that deterred or discouraged people from wanting to continue to reform criminal justice? I think there's a, f I think there's a fear among many reformers okay. that, the, that the spike will take some air out of the reform balloon, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not sh I'm not sure it will, and I think that the, the important thing is to not ignore the fact that we're having mm -hmm. an increase in violent crime, mm -hmm. uh, but to confront it and to use evidence-based strategies to combat it. Uh, I understand the, 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 the worries that uh, if you talk about it, you might just take people back to the bad old days where the only solution was to increase penalties and lock more people up for longer periods. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that danger is there. I think it's more dangerous to, um, to ignore the lives that are being lost mm -hmm. and to, uh, to, to not put a lot of energy and focus into doing the kind of street outreach and other community-based things that we know can actually knock these numbers back down. So in a word, are you optimistic or not? I am. I, 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 remain, uh, I remain optimistic um, in no small part because of the continued involvement of people like yourself in this issue. Um, I, I think there's more public engagement on the issue of criminal justice mm -hmm. uh, over the past year because of, uh, of, of what's happened uh, than there has been since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, there are some divisive elements of what's going on, and I do, uh, I do worry about the bipartisan coalition holding together, mm -hmm. but I think so far, uh, so far it is. Mm -hmm and that um, uh, we can continue to drive these numbers down and have better public safety. Well, even though you are a relatively new organization, I want to thank you for what you're doing, your leadership. You certainly have a few high-powered individuals who are part of either your task force or your, or your board, and so that's brought you a lot of credibility. So thank you for what you're doing. It's well needed on a national level as well as a, a local level. And thank you so much, Adam, also for being with us today. Thank you, John, and congratulations on your show. All right. Well, listen, we've had a wonderful discussion, but there's a part two. We're going to talk about restorative justice. Just, so just hang on, and we'll be right back. Once again, thank you for joining us today as we have discussed criminal justice reform. For the remainder of today's show, we're going to talk about the role of restorative justice. Today's guest is another friend of mine and a leader in our community. Please welcome Mr. Dwayne Brown, who is a Deputy Assistant Solicitor General of Fulton County. That's a long title. <laughs> it is a whole lot of words. <laughs> well, well, tell us a little bit about the Solicitor's Office. I'm, that may not necessarily be a common reference or term that people in the community know about. Well, well, first of all, thank you, John, for having us, and, and it's my pleasure to speak on the Fulton Solicitor's Office. Uh, in a nutshell, the Solicitor's Office is a prosecutor's office. You have different levels of prosecutors. You have a district attorney, which everyone knows and hears about, mm -hmm. who prosecutes felony crimes. And in your bigger jurisdictions like Atlanta and, and Cobb County and Gwinnett County, you have a Solicitor's Office who focuses their prosecution on misdemeanor crimes. Um, misdemeanor crimes are crimes such as, we, we call them quality of life crimes, mm -hmm. like DUIs, domestic violence cases, criminal trespass, people walking on other people's property, and, and theft cases. Mm -hmm. um, and these are more cases that everyday average people come into contact with the criminal justice system mm -hmm. through the misdemeanor cases and the solicitor's office. And, and in Fulton County solicitor's office is actually the biggest solicitor's office in the state of Georgia. We, we handle by volume the more, most cases in any other jurisdiction in the state of Georgia. So in a pre-pandemic year, any sense of what that number looks like? I know it's, is it, you talk about thousands and thousands or? Pre-pandemic year, we're probably talking about 10,000 cases. Okay, wow, wow. And so how long you been in the solicitor's office? So I've been a prosecutor for over 10 years. Okay. Um, I've just started working with the solicitor's office this year in 2021, was drawn to Mr. Gamage's approach right. to criminal justice. I've right. um, been a big advocate of his and admirer of his philosophy towards criminal justice. 
So, so after working in other offices and, and doing some other work in, in civil law, civil litigation, I, I was drawn back in to, to work with Mr. Gamage in the solicitor's office. So speaking of Mr. Gamage, who's the Solicitor General. Correct. So he oversees the whole office. He's come up with this concept of restorative justice. Yes. It seems a fancy term. <laughs> so put a little bit of meaning behind it. I mean, what does that mean, particularly in the area of criminal justice reform? Great question. And restorative justice is something that is kind of taking off over the last couple of years. And Mr. Gamage has been a huge mm -hmm. advocate of restorative justice. And, and what it basically means is looking at cases in a holistic approach, looking at trying to heal both parties involved and trying to craft, craft sentences that deal with underlying issues. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of what restorative justice is. And it, it's taken from the name restore. Mm -hmm. we, we are trying to heal communities, heal individuals who are involved in this system and, and looking at what we can do as an office to bring back a wholeness to the extent we can mm -hmm. to, to these individuals who came in contact with the system. You found that approach effective? I, f I found it very effective. Um, there's a lot of different types of theories and thoughts on mm -hmm. prosecution mm -hmm. and I'm sure you're aware John that there, there are some prosecutors um, who still believe that the way you handle crime is to hold people accountable for the crimes that they commit and that means sending them to jail for however long and removing them from, from, from society. Mm -hmm. they are, there's that thought. Uh, to me, that is not effective. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Gammage also, that's not effective because w what happens are that those people come back into our communities right. um, and their underlying issues are not addressed. They, they still can't get jobs. Mm -hmm. They still cannot be productive members in society. They're still dealing with paying probation fees and, and, and they're still having these interactions with the criminal justice system after they are held accountable, mm -hmm. a, a, as some would say. Um, and they end up re-engaging with the criminal justice system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so with restorative justice, we, we find it effective and as far as numbers, numbers wise, we find it effective because when people are going into the system now with restorative justice, we're looking at, okay, what is going on with you and, and what issues that can we help you deal with to, mm -hmm. to not have you come back in? you know, giving you substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, as opposed to just a conviction and, and, right. and trying to limit who gets a conviction mm -hmm. and sending cases to diversion. You know, and, and when we speak of diversion, diversion is a way of resolving a case without having someone get a conviction. Yeah. Diversion may be a class, an anger management class, you know, it, it may be counseling, um, family violence, you know, counseling, something other than standing in front of a judge and the judge saying you are now sentenced and you now have a record. So you painted the picture extremely well. Uh, you did say something about that kind of dabbled onto recidivism, which is another fancy word, repeat offenders. Do you think this restorative justice approach minimizes the likelihood of a person going back into the criminal justice system? Yes, absolutely. What restorative justice does and how it minimizes people from going back into the system, it's now giving people tools mm -hmm. to become productive members of society and, and, and addressing issues. Something, and, and you know, I, I have to go here, people become involved in the criminal justice system a lot of times because of things outside of their control. Sometimes it's poverty, it's lack of education, mm -hmm. and so you are now in your approach with restorative justice, figuring out how we can make sure this person has a complete um, employment, full employment now, mm -hmm. and, and working with our partners to, mm -hmm. to get this person jobs, job trainings, and, and as far as education, making sure they complete school as a condition of getting, getting rid of their case. And these things work because now we are giving them tools that a, a prison sentence wouldn't give right, them. Right. A prison sentence would just sit there and remove them from society mm -hmm. uh, and, and not make them be a productive members of society. And so when they come back, they, they really don't have the tools 
that, that would help them to figure out how they can avoid a life of crime. If I can give an example while, sure. while we're on that. When I was you know, a young prosecutor, first office, you know, I dealt with a case where an individual had multiple convictions for selling illegal drugs with the intent to distribute. He was a drug dealer. He had six or seven of them. Every year he got one. Every year he got another one. And so by the time I had his case, he had eight within 10 years. He went to jail for a couple of months, he came back out. And, and the reason why he kept doing that was because he had a conviction. He had convictions was limited what he can do in life. He didn't have a lot of other resources as a drug dealer, people would label him as. And so what he needed was someone and a program to teach him how to better use his skills mm -hmm. and someone to give him some education as, as to what he could do because he thought he was caught in a cycle. Yeah. And, and that's what happens are some individuals get caught in a cycle of once I get a criminal record, I have less resources. Right, right. Great story. Too many black males in the criminal justice system. If you can just go back in time in an individual's life, what do you think is needed from an intervention or a prevention standpoint to stop these guys going into the criminal justice system? What's the missing piece here? That, that's an excellent question. You know, I, I, I wish I could answer that uh, question and, and say that I know the answer to that question. If, if I were to, to come up with something, I would say a lot of men, young black men, are not surrounded by enough mentors. Mm -hmm. People who are, who, who, who look like them, who can say, hey, this person comes from a similar background as I am, and this person did something different. Mm -hmm. It is becoming bigger now to change the narrative as, as to what options for these young black kids other than sports mm -hmm. and, and entertainment. Uh, but if you go into some of these communities, communities and you engage with these kids, that's still the driving thing mm -hmm. is sports and entertainment and rappers, and that's who they listen to more. Right. And so making sure that we have more mentors and more people who that they can relate to would help. Has, has the solicitor's office adopted some sort of mentoring program, or is that just outside of the purview of what you would even consider doing? No, absolutely. Mr. Gamage feels strongly about engaging in kids mm -hmm. and engaging in our youth. And so he has a, a, a summit. The pandemic, we didn't have the summit, but before then he had a guns down summit where he brought in a lot of kids. He brought in some, some famous rappers mm -hmm. and they talked about what criminal justice system, ha what happens to you when you enter the criminal justice system, why it's smart to put down weapons and, and, and trying to get these rappers to also get in front of these kids and, and preach the same message as Mr. Gamage. Mm -hmm. and, and we routinely try to go to these schools and, and talk to the kids about the system and what can happen to you, even if you are someone who's not committing the crime, but you are following along with someone who is committing a crime. Man, this has been some great information. 30 seconds, I want to end this, this on a hopeful note. Restorative justice is hopeful, but anything that makes you hopeful about your work in the prosecutor's office? Yes, yes. Thank you, Quickly, for having us. And, and what I'm hopeful about is the approach prosecutors around the country are, are beginning to take mm -hmm. um, is to look at individuals who are coming into the system as people and, and not process, processing them and looking at creating sentencing alternatives to prison. And it, it's becoming, it's picking up traction and it is a slow moving process to change the criminal justice system, but the work of the groundwork is being laid and it is happening um, all across the country. Well, friends, we've heard a great dialogue with uh, Mr. Brown as well as Mr. Gelb earlier in the uh, segment. And now we're gonna come back with uh, some final thoughts from me. Just stay with me.
Too many black males today are stuck in a revolving door of criminal justice as they go into and out of the jails and prisons of America. Unfortunately, many released prisoners face barriers such as social isolation, dehumanization, and trouble finding employment, locating housing, and receiving public assistance. Within three years of release, 67% of ex-offenders are re-arrested. In the United States, former inmates are released and left to face hefty societal and economic barriers that hinder them and indirectly push them back into the criminal justice system. Today, however, we heard the perspectives of two proponents of criminal justice reform. They talked about improved police practices, a reduction of the number of arrests, the lessening of racial disparities in the criminal justice system, and restorative justice. Criminal justice reform should be a bipartisan issue. It is a win-win scenario. I hope that many more policymakers will take the lead from today's guests and do more to reform our antiquated system of criminal justice. Those are my thoughts. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for watching. Go to aibtv.com forward slash donate to support programming like this. Your contributions may be tax deductible.